Yeah, so my topic is uh, AI as a window on human intelligence. So, um, yeah, it's great that it's possible to go online now and play with some of these amazing systems that are popping up. Uh, it's, a, it's a crazy time in, in AI research. Like, it, you know, it's, it's just, it's hard even just to keep up, um, even if you're, you know, uh, in the biz. Um, and I, I used to try at, at the beginning of talks like this to give a kind of broad overview of the latest developments in AI, and I've just decided it's like impossible because things change so quickly, uh, and there's just so much to uh, so much to cover. And I want to I want to talk about this human intelligence bit. So I'm not going to spend that much time on it. I'll just mention two two things that have happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, many of you will have heard about uh, this one. I mean, it's been you know featured in the New York Times and. Um, you can also play with it online. Uh, I probably shouldn't be talking about uh, deep, a competitor to DeepMind, but you know, you got to give them credit. This is a cool system. Uh, ChatGBT is just a, a really high-performing language uh, model that um, you know uh, is pretty pretty convincing uh, in in what it can do. And um, and of course, it's you know, as those of you who follow this, this sort of thing know, it's one in a kind of unfolding series of generations of language models. Uh, in which a variety of organizations are, you know, contributing. Um, DeepMind has a, a language model called Chinchilla that was, you know, sort of at the top of the stack for a little while, and now OpenAI has this amazing thing. Um, uh, but that's one, you know, kind of exemplar of, of what's happening. Uh, another one um, that you may not have heard about because it hasn't been sort of as as much in the in the in the press, uh, but it also is something important that happened in the last couple weeks. Uh, is um, from this uh, uh, paper in Science. Uh, this one is from DeepMind. Um, um, colleagues of mine there, not not me personally. Um, it reports uh, uh, an AI system that reaches very high level um, performance, beating most human experts uh, in the board game of Stratega, which is actually like uh, surprisingly difficult. Um, you know, like there's a huge state space. There's um, hidden information. Uh, and uh, so this is another sort of you know pretty impressive uh, advance um, in AI. Um, those are just two examples, but I it, you know it's actually you, it's it's handy for me that these are two things that have happened in the last couple of weeks, because uh, as different as these applications are, uh, or these sort of you know systems or use cases, they they share a lot of the same uh, technology under the hood, and it's that technology actually that I'm going to kind of center on in the comments I want to make. So what, even though one of the systems that I mentioned is a language model that you, know, you can talk to and it talks back to you, and the other is this system that plays a board game, they are both examples of what's starting to feel kind of like a standard recipe for large-scale uh, high-performing AI systems in, you know, in today's scene. And that recipe focuses on bringing together two techniques or components. Uh, one of them is deep learning, and the other is reinforcement learning. Um, so let me just, and the combination is typically referred to as deep reinforcement learning. So let me just, to bring everybody along, let me make sure everybody knows broadly at least what these terms refer to. Deep learning is just a new name for what used to be called artificial neural networks. Um, those of us who have been around long enough to have started out calling it artificial neural networks, resisted for a long time, but eventually caved in and started calling it deep learning. Um, and the idea here, many of you be broadly familiar with it, you have neuron-like computation elements that are wired together uh, with synapse-like contacts, and usually in multiple uh, layers, you have some input uh, that's pr processed in a nonlinear fashion through this series of layers to an output layer, and then typically in a supervised learning setting, uh, the desired output is used in order to uh, generate an error signal, and then gradient descent learning, basically using the, the chain rule from calculus, is used to, to um, uh, adjust all of those connection weights or synapses through the system in order to get a little bit closer to that uh, output. And this is old technology, very old technology. Um, uh, but uh, it, it really um, came, uh, I sh guess I should say, came back to center stage in machine learning around 2012 when there was the first demonstration that it could really do something 
impressive, um, and that was uh, you know in the realm of image classification, um, and you know the 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 explosion of availability in in, in uh, um, uh, memory and computational uh, speed uh, has allowed us to really kind of discover what these systems are, are, are really capable of. And that's part of what's driving the AI revolution. But that's just the deep learning part. The reinforcement learning part actually derives from another strand uh, in machine learning that started off completely independent, um, starting in the 1980s, really. And this is, so reinforcement learning centers on this notion that you have an agent that lives in some environment and it's making observations of that environment, which tell it something about the state of the environment. Uh, and it has a, a policy that governs the actions that it will select in, in response to any uh, observation. Um, and once it selects that action, it's in a closed loop with the environment, so the, the environment changes in response to its actions. But importantly, it gets this thing called a reward signal, which is a scalar, right? It could be you know, positive or negative or zero. And, uh, the, the, the reward is, um, is uh, the, the, the whole idea in reinforcement learning is the agent wants to maximize that reward. So the, the field centers on algorithms that allow the agent to update its policy uh, in such a way that uh, over the long term, uh, its behavior yields more, uh, more cumulative reward, either in the average sense or there's a, there are discounted cases typically. And all, there are many ways of, of tackling that, but there's one kind of central idea that I'll come back to a number of times, so I'll introduce it now. And it's, uh, it's something referred to as temp temporal difference learning. And the idea here is that the agent for any state uh, maintains something called a value estimate. So uh, the, the idea the, in a value estimate is at least one kind of canonical version. Um, for any state, the value estimate summarizes the cumulative reward that the agent expects to, uh, to uh, uh, garner going forward from that state. So it's not the instantaneous reward that it expects for that state, but the cumulative re reward going forward from that state. And if you, if you have a good value estimate for any state you can be in, then that's a good basis for action, because you can, in deciding what action you're going to perform now, you can think about, well, what, what state would result from that action, and what's the value associated with that successor state, and that allows you to, um, to, uh, to choose actions in a, in a sensible way. How do you update this? What if you don't have a good value estimate? Well, the answer in, in temporal difference learning is you keep updating your value estimates based on your experience, and you do that using something called a, a reward prediction error. So you make an estimate of how good your situation is, you try an action, you see what happens one step later, uh, and that gives you a, a little piece of information that um, you know, maybe, maybe uh, if you look at the value of the successor state, things went better than you expected or they went worse than you expected, and you use that surprise, positive or negative, to modify your, your value estimate, and it, the idea is it gets better and better, and therefore your policy improves. So, um, Sorry, went down a little bit of a, a side, uh, side trip there to introduce you to temporal difference learning, but we're going to use that as we go along. Popping up a level, reinforcement learning. Um, uh, now, reinforcement learning and deep learning were pretty separate fields. Uh, people thought about ways of maybe bringing them together, but uh, the combination proved unstable and was considered uh, you know, not really practical for many years. But then in 2015, I'm proud to say, even though I had no hand in the work, uh, DeepMind introduced a series of you know, actually simple, uh, kind of simple methods or tricks that allowed um, deep learning and reinforcement learning to be brought together. And um, many of you know this work was published in Nature where uh, a, a deep reinforcement learning system learned to play Atari games at, a, at you know, superhuman levels. And the idea here is sort of obvious. There is a deep neural network, a deep learning system with many layers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you know, the input was the screen, uh, like the pixels on the screen, and the output was some joystick movement for the Atari game. And, um, but instead of using supervised learning where uh, you would say, oh, you, you move the joystick like this. You should have moved it like that. That was not the way it was set up. It was reinforcement learning. So every time the agent got a point in the game, that was a reward. And it was used in the style of reinforcement learning, temporal difference learning, to drive those weight changes. Um, and so there were reward prediction errors and value estimates and so forth. So that's deep reinforcement learning. Um, and it's proven to be a very... Um, 
a very potent combination uh, that's been, as we've already seen, applied in many settings. Okay, but my point here actually is not to review uh, applications of deep reinforcement learning uh, in AI, but instead to talk about um, some ideas uh, concerning what we might learn about human intelligence, human intelligence and brain function uh, from, from this uh, work in AI that I've just briefly introduced. So let's get into that. So there are some, like from one point of view, it's an easy argument to make that these techniques that I've just been talking about uh, might have something to tell us about human intelligence. Uh, to some extent, uh, that's almost circular because the methods themselves were originally inspired by either aspects of human or animal, animal intelligence or by things that were already known about uh, neuroscience, about brain function. So, of course, deep learning, uh, yeah, kind of obviously came from thinking about how the brain might work. Those, you know, neuron-like units are neuron-like for a reason, they were you know, introduced back uh, in, the, in the 50s as model neurons, quite literally. Um, and the earliest um, learning algorithms that were applied to uh, artificial neural networks were really you know, introduced as theories of brain function. Um, even back propagation, that, um, that weight update uh, um, gradient descent um, chain rule thing I mentioned, that was not introduced uh, uh, as a theory of how the brain might learn, but it was introduced by cognitive scientists who came up with the algorithm because they wanted to build systems that could do um, interesting cognitive tasks uh, and, and uh, employ those models as models of human cognition. Um, so, all right, so it's not difficult to make the connection between neural networks, deep learning systems, and, and human intelligence. And in fact, there's a long tradition of taking deep learning systems or artificial neural networks and literally using them as models of either brain function or, uh, or, or behavior. Um, you know, this is the sort of thing I was doing back in grad school you know, in, in, in 1999. Um, and with the kind of renaissance in deep learning research, this kind of, uh, ex this kind of um, uh, work has also uh, seen a resurgence. I just, these are just two you know, interesting papers that came out recently taking um, transformer models. That's the technology that's involved in these large language models I mentioned. And comparing, uh, comparing their operation and the internal representations that arise inside them uh, to, uh, to uh, patterns of activity seen in uh, various uh, uh, measures of brain function, for example. Um, I, this is a, a, a sample from a much larger literature. But let's move on. So this is, you know, we're starting with the easy stuff. Like, why might this stuff have anything to do with the brain? Well, that's neural networks. What about reinforcement learning? Well, it turns out, although I think many computer scientists who are interested in reinforcement learning don't realize this, that, that paradigm, too, came from, uh, from behavioral research. From, uh, in fact, uh, Rich Sutton, who, who's affiliated with Deep, not DeepMind now, um, uh, in his, you know, the initial work on reinforcement learning was literally talking about how do we understand certain patterns of, uh, of um, reward-driven learning in animals. So it came from that, uh, from that, uh, that uh, source as well. Um, and as many of you will know, uh, uh, later on when reinforcement learning has sort of matured as a field in machine learning, um, a connection, a, a, a much a much richer connection was established with uh, the neurobiology of reward-driven learning. Uh, and this, of course, has to do with um, a certain theoretical perspective on dopaminergic function, the idea being that uh, phasic do dopamine activity, um, uh, uh, measurable in the ventral tegmental area in the brainstem, uh, seems to uh, um, correlate highly with what you would expect a reward prediction error uh, signal to look like. So if a reward, if a cue occurs that's not inherently rewarding, but it suggests that a reward is coming soon, uh, dopamine gets all excited. Um, and then, it, you know, if the reward fails to arrive, you actually see a dip in dopamine. These kinds of observations led to that link being made with, um, with the reward prediction error and temporal difference learning. And other parts of the brain have been hypothesized to carry that value signal that I mentioned. So, um, so again, both of the ingredients here grew out of and have remained connected with uh, um, research uh, on brain function and behavior. So 
I could declare myself done and you know drop the mic, um, but uh, but I want to build on that. So I talked about how deep learning might relate to brain function quite broadly, and same for reinforcement learning. I haven't said anything yet about deep reinforcement learning, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my time. So um, uh, one thing that um, I find fascinating about deep reinforcement learning, and I hope this will come across at least in, in some of the details of the research that I'm going to describe, is that it's really, in many cases, more than the sum of its parts. So um, deep learning really is, what is deep learning about? Deep learning is about representation. It's about uh, um, uh, systems that build internal representations of the world and their own actions that are useful uh, for adaptive behavior. So you could say deep learning is about representation or knowledge or cognition. Um, reinforcement learning, on the other hand, is about motivation. It's about value. It's about goals, conation. Um, and uh, in systems that involve both of these, deep RL systems, we get to study not only the union of those two, but also their interaction. So we get to study how the way that a system represents the world impacts its motivations and the goals that it selects. We get to, um, we get, in a complementary way, we get to uh, study the way that a system's uh, 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 goals, the things that it considers rewarding, the way that that, that side of, the, uh, of things shapes its internal representations. Um, and you know, for me personally, I guess people study the brain for many different reasons, but for me personally, you know, if I can understand those two things, representation and motivation, I f I'll feel like I've understood a lot of what I, I personally want to know about the brain. You know, if I see you know, my dog doing this, I feel like I can get a pretty good distance toward understanding that behavior if I can explain that you know, what's going on in the dog's brain that corresponds to it wanting that ball. Uh, but knowing that if, it's, you know, if, if, if it positions itself in a certain way, it might fall in the water. It doesn't want to fall in the water. So we're going back and forth between knowledge and motivation. And I feel like there are many examples, not only for dogs, but for humans as well, where when you bring those together, that's really the whole, the whole picture. So that's why I'm excited about deep reinforcement learning. Um, in fact, uh, the working hypothesis in my uh, little group at DeepMind, I guess you could say, is that the brain just is a deep reinforcement learning system. Like, that's what it is. Uh, um, but that's, that's a working hypothesis that doesn't amount to much uh, because there are lots of different forms, specific forms, that a deep reinforcement learning system can take. You know, I showed you two. You can be a large language model that's fine-tuned using reinforcement learning on human feedback, or it could be a thing that plays, you know, a board game. Uh, and the underlying topology of the network and the algorithms that are applied are you know, very different uh, in those two cases. So th you know, the real question, uh, even if you accept my premise, is what kind of deep reinforcement learning system is it? And the, the, the research that I'm going to describe um, you know, will at least give you examples of you know, particular questions that can be asked. Um, underneath that, that high-level question and particular kinds of answers that we might be able to get. So, um, uh, so I want to describe three studies. And I'm a little terrified, because I've never tried to summarize these three studies um, in a single talk. And I'm not really sure uh, how the pacing will go. So I reserve the right later to speed through a bunch of slides that <laughs> I don't have time for. Um, but I thought it would be better to kind of give you a high-level uh, account of these three studies, um, leaving aside a lot of details with apologies, but to kind of give you three examples of, of how one can do research uh, in the effort to answer uh, or contribute to an answer to that question that I just raised. What kind of deep reinforcement learning system might the brain be? So here we go. Um, the first study I'm going to talk about is one that we just put a preprint on archive um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's not published yet. It's under review. Um, the second one is a paper we published in Nature Neuroscience uh, way back in 2018. And then the third one is um, a paper that was in Nature in 2020. 
right before the pandemic uh, shut everything down. Okay, so let's start with um, let's start with this this new study. So the, um, the 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 title of the paper is a unified theory of dual process control. So what is dual process control? So um, uh, some of you might be familiar with the basic idea from this very um, very uh, widely known book by Dan Dan Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. So the idea is that human cognition or human brain function um, can be understood as uh, uh, involving two processes, one that's fast and sort of habitual and maybe in the decision-making context relies a lot on heuristics, uh, and then a slower, more computationally intensive process uh, that is um, you know, kind of uh, um, uh, becomes involved in m more cognitively demanding decision-making situations or where the stakes are higher, that sort of thing, and sort of overrides that system one, the fast uh, and frugal thing uh, when needed. This, this, is a, this idea of dual systems or dual processes um, crops up across multiple subfields within cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience. One, one place where it's, I think, particularly well established is in... Um, uh, an area called uh, cognitive control, which is very much about prefrontal cortex. And um, the sort of canonical laboratory task uh, used to you know, introduce the relevant behavioral points is the Stroop task, where you have uh, a, a word that names a color, but it's presented in some color. And the color can either be congruent with the word, with the color named by the word, or it can mismatch, in which case you have an incongruent stimulus. And the observation is that if you ask people to read the word and ignore the color, they're equally fast uh, in responding in both of those cases. But if you ask them to name the color, then they're slower in that incongruent case because the, the identity of the word gets, gets in the way, right? Um, and there's been modeling of the underlying processes. Uh, um, there's sort of a whole, well, there's a whole literature on this, um, really kicked off by one of my thesis advisors, Jonathan Cohen at Princeton. And the basic idea um, that's implemented in these models is that you have some habit pathway, you know, system one, that's kind of automatic. And it, what it does is it implements the most frequent behaviors that you have to use in, 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 in your life based on the frequency of tasks that you've encountered. Here, the frequent task would be reading. Color naming is a very rare task. And so this kind of habit pathway becomes responsible for that default behavior. And then there's another system referred to classically in cognitive psychology as the control system that represents task context in a way that allows you, when needed, to override that automatic response, those habitual responses. So you, you see the dual process, dual system flavor of this thing. Um, the, that control function is broadly, you know, widely believed uh, in the research community, in the research community, to be um, implemented in some important way in prefrontal cortex. Uh, so, for example, in the Stroop task, people with focal brain uh, lesions have particular troubles with incongruent Stroop trials if they have uh, damage in this left dorsolateral region. Um, uh, and a, an indication of why that is comes from studies with non-human primates that's provided evidence that there are individual neurons in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that represent task context. So if you train a monkey to perform two different tasks on, a, on the same set of stimuli, you'll find that uh, there are neurons in prefrontal cortex that sort of become active when one of those tasks is, is cued and other neurons will become active when the other task is cued. So task representation. Uh, seems to live in part in the prefrontal cortex, which goes, you know, it fits well with this dual system theory, right? You have habitual behaviors implemented somewhere else in the brain. Uh, the basal ganglia thought to be important here. Um, posterior sectors of the basal ganglia, I guess I should say. Uh, and then you have the prefrontal cortex that's um, more laboriously keeping track of exactly what the current task demands are, and it's part of a system that, when necessary, will override those habits. Okay. Um, another quick example, which we're going to come back to in some simulations, uh, navigation. So if I tell someone uh, I want them to uh, take a walk to some destination in the neighborhood, um, uh, there's evidence that the prefrontal cortex is involved if that, uh, if that trip is not completely routine. 
if, it's, if it involves figuring out a path that you, know, you don't traverse every day. It's not like you know, the, the route that you follow to the, to, to the train station at, at the end of work every day. Um, so you see that in, in neuroimaging studies when you compare uh, activity in that kind of routine setting where you're following some path that you've followed a million times versus a, a less routine situation where you really have to actively represent the goal and do a little planning, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex becomes active in that setting. And again, in brain lesions, uh, the setting of, of uh, focal brain damage, patients with prefrontal damage uh, have difficulty with goal-directed navigation. Um, uh, and it's uh, specific, if you, if you, I won't go into the details of this plot, but the, it's just there to remind me to explain the punchline of this um, particular neuropsychology study. If you studied the navigation behavior of patients with a certain form of prefrontal damage, what they tend to do is they will fail to end up at the goal that you asked them to find, and uh, more often than not, they'll end up at a goal that, um, that they, very frequently, uh, they very frequently navigate to. So again, they're having trouble representing that, that task context, that non-routine part, and they're defaulting to habitual behavior. This is like the dual, the dual process story. Okay. So this, you know, the behavioral phenomena uh, and the, the broad like computational idea is very well established across multiple, um, multiple fields. But there's absolutely no story, as far as I'm aware, of why. Why would the brain be set up this way? Uh, it's not obvious that it's necessary. Um, you know, I can easily train a single recurrent neural network to navigate both to frequent destinations and infrequent destinations, and interesting things may happen inside that network. Uh, but it's not a dual process system. So, if this really is what's going on in the brain, if there really are these dual systems or dual processes, the question arises, the normative question arises, like why would that have evolved? Is it helpful in some way for the brain to be arranged uh, in this dual process fashion? And the work that I'm gonna briefly describe now you know, aims to get at uh, a possible answer. Um, and we start, uh, we start elsewhere. Um, so, of an obvious demand of adaptive behavior is the ability to generalize or transfer to, sit to new situations, but based on their resemblance or shared structure with situations you've dealt with in the past. So, you know, you go into a, ho a hotel room, uh, you haven't dealt with a room configured that particular way, your bed at home isn't made up that way, the lamps in the room may have ways of turning them on and off that are not completely familiar, but you're okay. Like, it doesn't take long for you to figure out what's going on. Um, and that, that in itself is an example of this kind of transfer or generalization. It's like you take your, your past experience and you can apply it, even in a situation that's you know, at least superficially different. Um, learning a new board game would be another example. Um, you, know, you have all sorts of background knowledge about board games, so it really doesn't take you that long to get up to speed on a new board game. Um, so what's involved in this? This is clearly a demand uh, of adaptive behavior. What does it require? Well, um, generalization and transfer, another way of thinking about them is in terms of prediction. So I walk into this hotel room. It's different from any room that I've been in before. But because I'm familiar with rooms in general, I can make some reasonable predictions. You know, I, I can make some reasonable predictions about how you turn, how, how you're going to turn on those, those lights. You know, either there's a switch on the light itself or there's a light switch somewhere and you kind of have theories about where the light switches should be. This is a form of prediction based on your past experience. Um, now, once we reframe things in terms of prediction, we can ask, what does it take to make good predictions based on your past experience? Well, the statistical learning literature offers an answer to that, which is compression. If you can take your past experience and represent it in a very succinct, compact way, the chances are that that representation of your past experience is going to give rise to more useful predictions uh, in, um, in new situations. Like, you know, I'm, I'm using English to describe this, but there's all sorts of beautiful math uh, used to justify that assertion. Um, we'll get into a little bit of it here. So there are many ways of taking the next step and saying what exactly it means to have a nicely compressed representation of your past. But there's one 
uh, that has a fairly big footprint in the statistical learning literature, and then we're going to we're going to anchor on it, which is called um, the minimum description length principle. So imagine you have a data set, and you want to come up with a good representation of that data. Um, call that a model, a good model of that data, uh, and the model will take the form of something that generates a bunch of data, uh, and a, what would make it a good model of the target data set is that uh, there's very little discrepancy between the data that it generates and that target data. And we can measure that, that difference uh, in information theoretic uh, terms as um, something like the number of bits it would take to encode the difference between those two data sets, right? or the comograph complexity um, uh, of a, uh, a system that would have to uh, correct all of the errors that that model made. So clearly, you want a model that captures the data. That's sort of a no-brainer. But the other half of this expression, it said, the L is for description length. The other half of this expression uh, that is um, uh, propounded in minimum description length is, says you also want your model to have a, small, to have a, a, a short description length. If, if you needed to count the number of bits required to describe that model, so Kolmogorov complexity is a good way of thinking about this again, you would want that also to be compact. So another way of saying that is you want the, the, your model to be simple. right? You want it to be um, compressible. So the, the MDL principle says choose a model that captures as much of your data as possible, but which is also simple. And you should be willing to maybe give up a little bit of fidelity in order to uh, you know, end up with a nice compact uh, model, which is nice because it means you might, the stuff that you're leaving aside, uh, the variance that you're leaving on the table, so to speak, might be the noise, right? That, that's the intuition here. Um, okay, so how, can we bring that minimum description length idea into reinforcement learning? Because we said it might be good for a, a decision-making agent to compress its past behavior in, as a basis for making new predictions, um, let's use the MDL principle to build something like that. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to say, what's the data? The data is the policy. The data is the mapping from situations to actions that the agent implements, um, this, this, uh, this function pi. All right, once we, once we put that in place, the rest follows pretty naturally. We have the policy taking the place of the data. What takes place of the model is, uh, something new we're going to introduce, which is an auxiliary policy. We'll call it pi, pi naught for sort of historical reasons. Sometimes I'll refer to it as the default policy. Okay? And we're going to apply the, the minimum description length principle. We want our, uh, our, our auxiliary policy, pi naught, to be similar to the behavioral policy of the agent. But we also want that default policy to be simple. That's, the, that's what we're stipulating going into this, and a whole bunch of interesting things follow from that. So um, we're going to take this, and we're going to uh, insert it into full bore reinforce, reinforcement learning by constructing uh, uh, an overall objective function for learning that looks like this. This is just kind of a high-level summary of a much more detailed uh, thing. But we've got this MDL set of terms, uh, and we're going to balance that against expected reward. So reinforcement learning is about changing your policy to maximize expected reward. And now we're going to say, yes, update your policy so that you reap more and more reward, but also try to, at the same time, satisfy this MDL criterion uh, by updating this default policy so that it's compact, uh, but that it's also close to your behavioral policy. All right, so we can, luckily, the current deep learning and deep RL literatures give us ways of actually building a, a deep learning agent that um, approximates uh, this logic. So um, the idea here is we have um, a, a, sorry, a, a, an agent that takes observations of the, environments, of the environment and emits actions. Uh, but it, has, it implements two policies, as opposed to the agents I showed you at the beginning. It implements a policy pi, which is its behavior policy. But it also implements this other policy, pi naught, this kind of default policy. And they're implemented in two different 
recurrent neural networks that are operating in parallel. So what happens is the agent makes an observation, it selects uh, an action uh, using this lower pathway, this is the, the default path pathway, um, and then in parallel it also selects an action using this other uh, um, pathway up top, which has the same number of units in it and so forth. Um, and, uh, and an action is selected at the end purely based on this, uh, this, this behavior policy. So basically, the, the default policy chooses an action, and then the other pathway overwrites that. So this default policy is only playing a role in kind of shaping, shaping the policy during learning. All right. We're gonna, we can get this uh, description length thing going using some, uh, some off-the-shelf methods from the deep learning literature. Uh, one, to, to get this term uh, implemented is simple. We want the behavior policy and this default policy to be similar. So how do we get that into our objective function? We just take the, the KL divergence, the Kubler, uh, uh, Kubler, uh, the KL divergence. I'm not gonna be able to spit it out. Um, uh, the, this complexity cost, the thing that says, hey, keep that default policy simple, that's a little richer, like that, that's a little bit less off the shelf. And we use something um, uh, um, uh, called variational dropout. And the, the intuition is that the, the, the weights in this lower network are noisy. And there's a regularizer that says, make them as noisy as possible. And the noisier the, the network is, obviously, the less information it can precisely uh, process, which is a kind of analog of saying that it, it's, it's, it has to be simple, right? Because it can't make fine distinctions. All right, so good, now we've got an agent. We've got an agent that has this default policy that wants to be simple. And we have another, uh, another policy that doesn't care how complex it is. It's not penalized uh, for being complicated, but it is penalized for departing from that simple policy. Okay, so hopefully either you're into the details or you're at least getting the gist. Um, we call this, uh, this, um, this approach, this architecture, this setup, um, uh, minimum description length control, or you know, we lovingly refer to it as middle C. Uh, and from a machine learning point of view, it works. If you train an agent with this setup I just described, uh, on, uh, in settings where there are multiple tasks that share structure, and after training on multiple um, draws from a task distribution, you give it a new task to learn, it will learn that new task faster. So if you make an agent that navigates around in a little grid world, uh, and you, during the initial training, you only present it with a subset of the locations as goals, and then at test, you give it the held out locations, it will learn to get to those held out locations using a shortest path faster if you use this, uh, this regularization scheme, these dual pathways. And you find the same thing with you know, continuous control. So it, it seems to work uh, from a machine learning point of view. But I promised you some insight into why the brain might be uh, organized this way. Right? So I've given you some evidence that this helps with generalization and transfer. But does the resulting system like, shed any light on the phenomena that I described to you as the initial evidence for thinking that there are dual processes in the brain. Okay, so I'll briefly explain why I think that um, that's what you get. So going into this, I might end up referring to this lower pathway as the habit pathway, right? Because that, that's the path, that ultimately that pathway ends up absorbing all the shared structure across these different tasks. Uh, uh, and then I'll refer to this upper pathway sometimes as the control pathway, because it doesn't have to be simple. It can, it can uh, pick up on all the uh, little differences between tasks, um, uh, as long as uh, most of the shared structure is captured by these habits, that'll keep the control policy from ever departing too much from those habits. Hopefully that intuition is, is there. We'll have a chance to rehearse it in some details. All right. Um, I want to move on to the other studies, so I'm just going to um, move pretty rapidly through these sort of neuroscience-related results. But remember the, the um, navigation scenario. Uh, the prefrontal cortex is engaged, the control system is engaged, mainly when you have to get someplace you're not used to getting. Uh, and when you damage the prefrontal cortex, people tend to kind of default to familiar destinations and kind of ignore your instruction to go to someplace non-routine. We see exactly the same thing when we train our middle C agent on navigation tasks. So 
we, we have methods that I'm not going to have time to describe, which allow us to diagnose what's being represented from the input in that habit pathway. And it turns out that the habit pathway pays attention to some things, and it ignores other things. And in the navigation setting, it pays attention to what, where the agent is right now and also what action it just selected. But it pretty much ignores the current goal queue. So this, this lower pathway in the network I showed you just does not care what you're telling, what destination, what goal location is being uh, encouraged in the input. So the input is saying, go to this goal location. And the habit pathway is just la, 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 doesn't care. Um, so obviously, the agent is performing OK. So that goal location must be represented in that upper pathway, which is really operating like the prefrontal cortex. It's taking responsibility for representing uh, high-level context and goals, task representations. Uh, and then it overrides this habit pathway when those goals call for it. And um, you can see this in its behavior. So if you train the agent to navigate in an environment where there's a goal queue that's presented very frequently, say this location up here, and another goal queue that's, that's only presented very rarely during training, the, the trained agent is fine at getting to that infrequent goal when it's queued. But if you, if you damage, if you remove, essentially, that upper pathway, that control pathway, and leaving, that leaves only that habit pathway, the agent just blithely ignores the fact that you're telling it to go to this unusual destination, and it goes to its favorite habitual destination. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to blast past um, a similar simula simulation that addresses the Stroop task. Um, the the, the, the take-home message here is that we've, we've offered a, a normative computational account for why the brain might have dual processes or dual systems, leveraging deep reinforcement learning in order to implement the idea. And the idea is adaptive behavior requires generalization. Generalization requires good prediction. Prediction benefits from compression. One nice form of compression is, um, comes from the minimum description length principle. And if you just take MDL, put it into RL, a lot of phenomena from neuroscientific and behavioral studies of dual systems or dual processes just kind of fall right out. Um, there's, there's more in this paper. We also address heuristic use, the kind of thing that um, Danny Kahneman was talking about in his book, and uh, phenomena from the um, reward-based learning literature on model-free versus model-based um, patterns and reward-driven learning. That's why it's called a unified theory. But um, my point here was just to kind of give you a, give you a sense, like give you an example of how we can use um, computational ideas implemented in deep reinforcement learning uh, in order to you know, offer, potentially offer uh, some, some insights on human intelligence. OK, the, the other two studies I'm going to talk about in like v v only very high level, because I don't have much time. Um, but it would be a shame if I only told you about that one study, because the point here is to kind of give you a sense of the range of things that might be possible. So let's, let's blast through these other studies. So generalization and transfer. Um, yeah, they are largely about handling some new situation based on knowledge gleaned from many past experiences. But there's another thing that goes on uh, in intelligent behavior, which is you learn on the fly. So you know, if I, if I figure out how one of those lamps works in the, in, in the hotel room, I will update my guesses about how the other lamps are going to work. Uh, or if I see somebody make a smart move in this board game that I'm, uh, that I'm learning, I might make the inference that, that that smart move could also legally be made in other positions on the board. How am I, how am I making those inferences? Well, it's, I understand something about the structure of these tasks or of these environments. Right? Where did that knowledge come from? Maybe some of it's innate, but a lot of it is it's self acquired through learning. And this is something that psychologists have been talking about for decades under the heading of learning to learn. The corresponding term in machine learning is meta learning. Uh, so, um, a, a, a classic example from psychology comes from this work by Harlow, where Harlow had uh, monkeys, uh, uh, he kind of confronted them with two unfamiliar objects. The monkey had to choose one of the objects, and there was a raisin underneath it or nothing. Uh, a screen came down, and the objects were placed back. Uh, they could be left, right, reversed. Um, and the monkey tried again. And this re 
repeated for six rounds. And then the monkey was given a totally new pair of objects and the whole thing repeated. And then a new pair of objects and the whole thing repeated. And the point of the experiment was that there was a rule that said that uh, even though the objects could be left, right, reversed, there was always one object that was rewarded. The, there was always a raisin under one of those objects uh, and not under the other, regardless of its position. And what, what the study showed was that uh, as the monkey got more and more experience across many pairs of objects, ultimately uh, it got to be, uh, you know, the, the monkey became a one-shot learner. So it would pick up one object, see the, whether there was a raisin under it or not. And after that, all the, the remaining five uh, rounds, it would show perfect, um, perfect performance. And this suggests the monkey had induced the rule. So there's learning to learn. How might that happen um, in a brain? Well, in this study, we showed that, in fact, it happens almost inevitably in deep reinforcement learning systems, as long as they have recurrent connectivity, as long as there's, some, there's memory in the connection weights, right, and in the synapses that builds up, you know, that accrues slowly over time. But there's also this other form of memory, which is in the activity. Like, think of it maybe as working memory, the activity dynamics of the network. So if you have a, a quite generic recurrent neural network, and it's taking in observations of the environment, selecting actions, it's trained with reinforcement learning in the same way we've been describing all along. And now you train it again, not on one task, but on a series of interrelated tasks. So the simplest example would be a series of bandit tasks. So it has to learn which of the two actions, left or right, is more rewarding. Uh, but then after some experience with that bandit problem, you give it another bandit problem with different underlying reward parameters. And then another bandit problem with different parameters. Uh, so these are draws from some task distribution. And then at the end of all that, you freeze the weights in the network. Right, this is important. You stop the synaptic change, and you give it a new bandit problem that's never seen before. What's going to happen? Well, the naive answer is nothing. The, there's no synaptic learning. But in fact, in, what happens empirically is the agent does just fine. It solves the bandit problem. Uh, you know, so you can see it choosing left, right, and then finally deciding that right is the correct answer. Uh, or in a harder problem, it kind of vacillates for longer, uh, but it eventually figures out the right thing. And you can quantify its performance in the terms of uh, cumulative regret. And it, this little network is competitive with off-the-shelf uh, bandit algorithms. So how is it doing this? Well, it has no weight changes going on. So the only thing that could be learning is its internal activity state. Uh, and that, in fact, is what's going on. You can do multidimensional scaling and visualize, I guess PCA is what we use for these diagrams. Look at how that activity pattern is evolving over time. And you know, as it gets more experience with, an, with a bandit problem where the right answer is on the left, it kind of migrates to one attractor. If the right answer is on the right, it goes to another attractor. If it's harder, it might vacillate, but eventually gets to the right place. It's all in the activity dynamics. Um, and you can train it on the same kind of task that Harlow used. We, used, we kind of translate it into a visual saccade task, and you get exactly the same behavior there. So these little recurrent neural networks actually are learning to learn. How are they doing it? Well, the slow changes that are happening in the connection weights over many, many samples from the task distribution are shaping the activity dynamics. They're shaping the way that patterns of activity evolve as the agent gets observations within any particular uh, uh, sample task. Those activity dynamics are implementing their own learning algorithm, which can be very fast and can be adapted to the domain. So this is meta-learning. This is one learning algorithm that's driving synaptic change, giving rise to another learning algorithm that's much more fast and flexible. Um, and I don't have time to give any of the details here, but in the paper, we, we then map this onto neuroscience by blithely saying, well, you know, temporal difference learning, RL, is like what happens in the brain in, in dopamine-driven learning. And this heavily recurrent network that um, is so important to this effect, well, we know the prefrontal cortex is very highly uh, recurrent. Uh, and so we're sort of going to you know, ignore a million details and uh, pretend that this simple recurrent neural network is something like the prefrontal uh, network, and it's being shaped by dopamine-driven learning, what can we understand or explain from neuroscience? And it turns out we can understand and explain a whole spate of results from uh, neuroscience studies across many domains, including um, modeling uh, a single unit activity in uh, bandit tasks from monkeys, 
looking at the way that behavior uh, in humans and monkeys, the learning rates change depending on the, the degree of change in a target task. Um, some fancy and interesting things in the way that dopamine responds and kind of the, the knowledge it seems to have about task structure. A bunch of uh, previously unexplained findings in neuroscience can be explained by this meta-learning thing. Okay, so um, I didn't notice whether the clock was set at 45 or 50, but I think, we're, I think we're pretty much out of time. Okay, so let me just take 30 seconds, because I'm not gonna have time to, to tell you about this study in any detail. I'm gonna give you the slightest taste, though. Um, this was a study where we, uh, capital, we, we explored um, something called distributional uh, reinforcement learning, which is a technique that had been developed in, in AI. Uh, and the idea here was to take reinforcement, reinforcement learning signals, the real word prediction error, instead of just using a single number to represent them, represent them as a whole distribution. Here, you know, my future might be good, my future might be bad, I'm gonna represent the whole distribution. Um, that helps in AI, it helps in, in you know, when agents learn to play video games. Uh, and so we teamed up with Nao Chida at Harvard and asked whether the same thing might be going on in the brain. Obviously that meant doing some detailed measurements of, of dopamine. Uh, and what we found uh, in Nao's uh, VTA data was that in fact, many of the um, structures that you find in distributional TD learning in, in AI systems show up in, in dopamine neurons. So dopamine neurons have tuning curves that vary in systematic ways and that can be shown mathematically to, you know, if the, if the dopamine neurons really are responding the way it looks, they are implicitly coding a whole distribution over futures. Okay, um, conclusion slides. So I've given you a whirlwind tour of three projects, but my, my real purpose is not to like sell you on those projects, but instead to give you some examples of how we might use deep reinforcement learning to understand a human neuroscience and, and behavior uh, following this idea that the brain is a deep reinforcement learning system. We're trying to figure out what kind it is. Um, hopefully the punchline from each of these studies is, uh, is doesn't, doesn't need to be repeated and I'll speed by it. I'll just close by saying, you know, these studies all use very small scale deep RL systems. That's nice because they're analyzable, but you know, AI is generating deep RL systems now that are capable of extremely sophisticated behavior. And, and in many cases, it's not just one behavior. It's not just the ability to play Stratego, but increasingly these systems can do many things. And so we get to maybe have the opportunity to explore the way that tasks are represented relative to one another and rich cognitive things like that. So I'm hoping that uh, as the field, the AI applications of DeepRL um, you know, continue to mature, that'll just increase our opportunities for doing this kind of um, neuroscience research. Good, so thanks for letting me go over by a couple minutes. I just wanna quickly acknowledge my main collaborators on this uh, range of projects. Uh, Ted Moskovitz at uh, UCL, and I mentioned now at Harvard, and then my DeepMind colleagues, Will Dabney, Jane Wong, and Zeb Kurth Nelson. And thank you very much.